to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. But I'm going to start out by doing exactly the opposite. I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to tell you. And what I'm not going to tell you is the focus of our story is the court martial proceeding that happens after Second Manassas. We are not going to talk much about Second Manassas itself any more than necessary to tell the story of the political and the legal considerations. Um, most of you know more about Second Manassas than I do. Many of you went with Mark on the bus tour. You read John Hennessy's book, so we're going to talk about the aftermath, the political and the legal consequences. And now I'm going to try the clicker for the first time. There's going to be a lot of text up here on your screen. For me. Ah, it worked. It worked. Court martial in the Civil War. That's quite a number of cases that we're talking about there. The, uh, the number represents the federal side, 80,000. And there are surviving records for some 35,000 courts, courts martials representing over 175,000 soldiers. A court martial was not necessarily aimed at producing a verdict. As you can see there on the screen, they are often used as disciplinary measures. The thought was that with regard to minor violations, that the threat or bringing of charges before a court martial would be adequate punishment, even if the individual was acquitted by the board. And in the case of a court martial, the finding a guilty verdict did not necessarily mean removal or any type of extreme sanction. And you can see the list of penalties that could be afforded to an individual who was convicted in the court martial. But one, though, has stuck with us, and that is the court martial of Fitz John Porter, which the, the trial begins in December of 1862 in the aftermath of Second Manassas and will last into early 1863. It will produce over a thousand pages of court record, and the finding of the court and the conduct of the trial are, are among the most controversial episodes in the history of military justice in the United States. Here's our friend Fitz John Porter, born into a prominent naval family with famous cousins. Um, Admiral Porter and Admiral Farragut are cousins, Farragut by adoption. General Porter's father was a bit of a ne'er-do-well, a naval officer who grounded his first command and had a problem with the father and was put on land duty and effectively drummed out of the Navy. His mother ran the household, and the family was always struggling for cash. For those of you that are Academy graduates, my, apologize, my apologies for the uh, quote there from Bill Marble, but I find it fascinating when he says that uh, the military careers provided a standard so solution for the financially embarrassed of the former upper classes. When you look at Porter's record, everything about him says that he is going to be a tremendously successful military officer. He graduates eighth in his class from West Point. He performs valiantly in the Mexican War. He is an instructor at the academy and serves briefly as the adjutant. He will, he will make his way to Utah with Albert Sidney Johnston for the Mormon campaign. And then with the outbreak of the Civil War, 
He will very soon find himself becoming very close with a fellow West Point graduate who was a year behind him. Uh, Porter's class did not produce luminaries. The two that you've probably heard from that class are Fitz John Porter and a man by the name of Carl Stone. Does that name ring a bell? Things didn't go well for General Stone either. But the cadet in the class behind him is a man by the name of George Britton McClellan. And Porter and McClellan will become fast friends, confidants, and Porter performs extremely well with McClellan on the Peninsula Campaign. He has written up with a great awe by McClellan for his performance at Bowery Hill, well deserved. But the association with McClellan is going to prove it to be Porter's eventual undoing. Now we're going to play a little, a little picture game here. Who do we have up on the screen? First of all, that handsome gentleman in the top left. Who is that? McClellan, the top left. In, in the top left, we have Pope. General John Pope, one of the more interesting characters that you're going to find, uh, a disruptor, a braggart. But if we did not take seriously or did not move along every military officer who was a braggart and was uh, rather pompous and self-assured, we'd have a rather thin officer corps. But there is a problem with Pope. Beyond, beyond his braggadocio is his mendacity. And he is known by his men to be a liar. He does not tell the truth. Top center, everybody knows, is George B. McClellan. The fellow on the right at the top is voted as person least likely to buy a vacation home in Manassas. <laughs> He had two visits to Manassas, General McDowell, and they ended up rather peculiarly in similar circumstances, with the Army being forced from the field and making their way piecemeal back to Washington, and in both cases, who gets called to rescue the mess? George Britton McClellan. Now, the bottom two may not leap out at you. First of all, the rather sleepy looking fellow on the left. That is Porter's lawyer. His name is Reverdy Johnson. He is a very effective lawyer. He's one of two, but it's Reverdy Johnson that does most of the work, most of the damage in the trial of Fitz John Porter. And the other is Joseph Holt. Holt is the Judge Advocate General for the United States Army. He's a Kentuckian. And we're going to meet him again later on in military judicial history. He will be the prosecutor that will try the Lincoln conspirators before the commission after the assassination. And these two are going to lock horns. They're very skilled, very effective counsel, and they are a lot of fun to watch. anything down that you don't want to see pinned on the bulletin board in the coffee room. <laughs> Good advice. Especially if what you're writing down contains criticisms of your superiors. It is certainly something that Fitz John Porter could have learned and exercised a bit of caution in that area. But hope comes to the East to head up a new force, the Army of Virginia, and comes in with bluster, braggadocio. He says, my headquarters are in the saddle. 
which prompted many of his critics to say that his headquarters are where his, uh, where his hindquarters should be. <laughs> that we are used to seeing the backs of our enemies, which prompts the kind of response that I think you see from General Sturgis. And now this John Porter's comment. Are you going to write a letter to someone saying that your boss is an ass? <laughs> and then how do you feel after you write said letter saying that your boss is an ass and said letter makes its way to your boss? <laughs> and to his boss? He had communicated this to a rather chatty Census Bureau official by the name of Joe Kennedy, who thought nothing of sharing the information, not understanding the notion of confidence, and shared it widely, including with the administration and General Polk. The next group are communications that Fitzjohn Porter sent to Ambrose Burnside. Uh, Burnside's an interesting character. He, he honestly does not seem cut out for a military career. He's kind of a gentle soul and a naive individual. And he thinks nothing of taking these dispatches that Porter has sent to him in confidence and forwarding them in bulk to the War Department. That's not going to end well. And then the last quote from General Porter himself, and this is something I'm going to circle back to at the very end, that one of his problems is that he does not associate his conduct with what happens to him. He doesn't think about the risk of what he's saying when he says it. The trial that will begin in December of 1862, it does not take place in what we would typically think of as a courtroom. Had an illustration there that it takes place in a, in a room that had been a courtroom, but is now just a business room above a restaurant on 14th Street across from Willard. And there is not a raised bench, witness tables. They sit around a table. Ah, the second battle of Manassas. Again, we're not going to go into the X's and O's, but the things that we need to know, first of all, John Porter, or John Pope, is terrible at writing orders. His orders are verbose, are confusing, are contradictory. Certainly one of them up there, the joint order, we're going to see the text of that in, in a couple of slides, but the joint order simultaneously told Porter and McDowell to move forward to halt and prepare to fall back, all at the same time. Porter was convinced that Pope had no clue as to what he was doing. And Porter was right. Pope's biggest problem on the battlefield is that he has an idea, he has a fantasy actually, of where his troops are and where the enemy are. And he cannot be shaken from that. And he issues orders based on his perception of the battlefield, which is not even in the same county as reality. And it is the inaccurate orders of John Pope that creates the entire mess. What 
Gospel fits John Porter be charged with? Well, there are two major charges coming out of 2nd Manassas. And within those two charges, there are nine subcharges, nine specifications. First of all, there is a charge. John Pope says that he ordered Fitz John Porter to begin to move his troops from Warrenton toward the battlefield at one o'clock in the morning. Porter begins to move at three o'clock and arrives on the field at about 10 a.m. Porter has a lot of explanations and reasons and justifications as to why he could not move sooner than he did. The night was very dark. The roads were clogged. The wagons were in the way. It was difficult to get the artillery in a position to move along with the infantry. Things that perhaps should be within the sound discretion of a corps commander to decide whether or not to move. But just, let's just stop for one second. If the charge is that he failed to move at 1 a.m. and departed at 3, how busy will the military courts be if we court-martial every officer who's two hours late executing an order and put them on trial for their lives? Charge of disobeying three particular orders. The order to march toward Bristow Station, the infamous joint order, which will come up in just a bit, and the order, the, the 430 order to attack the Confederate flank and rear. Charge number two is misconduct before the enemy, described as a shameful retreat, the kind of charge that will be most painful for a professional officer to endure. Second Manassas takes place at the end of August 1862, then Lee forces the issue as he moves into Maryland with the Antietam campaign. Washington was in chaos after the Second Battle of Manassas. Well, if you read the newspaper accounts of what was happening in Washington, that the banks were offloading gold and silver into barges and floating them away from the capital that there were trains that were prepared to take the president and cabinet away from Washington. And as we mentioned, who was called in to stabilize the situation and prepare to strike against Lee? George McClellan. So the court martial is delayed until after the Antietam campaign. After Second Manassas, Pope is largely dispatched to the West to Indian country and is little heard from for the rest of the war, with the exception of the court martial. But come late November, Pope is insisting that his friends move against Porter. And first of all, a an inquiry commission is organized, but that is soon converted into a court martial. But there is a problem with that court martial because the Articles of War at the time require that if the commanding general is the complaining witness, then the panel must be picked by the president. Abraham Lincoln would have had to have selected the members of the court martial. That does not sit well with two individuals that are, one in particular,
Cooper is going to play a very major part in this little drama. Secretary Moore, Edwin Stanton, and Henry Howard. They're looking for a more hand-picked court. But in order to do that, Pope can't be the complaining witness. So they use a subterfuge where Pope's inspector general, a miscreant by the name of Benjamin Benny Roberts, is actually the complaining witness. So that Pope can go on the stand and just be a fact witness, an impartial observer, and not the the witness or not the instituting complaining witness against Ford. And to most observers, the court that was largely hand selected by Stanton and Halleck. Well, there were two members of the court that had clear conflicts of interest that never should have been on the bench. And there were several others that were predisposed to a finding of guilty. It was not a fairly constructed court in any way, shape, or form. And the question I've always had, and I don't know the answer to it, is what would Abraham Lincoln have done differently? If the question of naming members of the court would have come to him, rather than being left with Stanton and Hell. Here's our court martial board. Presided over by Major General David Hunter. Uh, Hunter is a staunch Republican. You know, uh, General Hitchcock there is uh, one of his a senior member of the panel, shall we say, the West Point class of 18, 1817. But off the top, can you see the two witnesses, or the two members of the court that are problematic to be sitting on the court martial? Two that should in no way, shape, or form have ever been near this trial. They are James Ricketts, and Rufus King. And why shouldn't they be anywhere near this trial? Well, guess what? Where were they at the end of August uh, 1862? They were at Manassas. And how did they perform? Terrible. So a guilty verdict against Porter could very well be used to de deflect and divert blame from them. There is no way that they've ever, they ever should have been seated on this panel. General Casey, Porter had worked to have him removed from his command during the Peninsula campaign. A variety of interests that are predisposed to, if not convicting, certainly not holding a favorable view of Fifth John Porter. You notice that we see uh, General William W. Morris replaced. Why is he replaced? <laughs> well, he raised the issue on his own motion that the court martial was illegal based on the identity of the complaining witness. He said that this is not properly constituted, we need presidential appointments. Lo and behold, the good general is off the court and replaced by a much more amenable and pliant subject. First legal hurdle we're going to get to. Did the charges against Fitzjohn Porter state a claim? Do we have a basis for going to trial? In my mind, there is only one of these up here out of all the, the nine subcharges that has enough legal weight to have been properly considered by the court. And that is the first charge of not moving his troops in a timely fashion. There 
is no doubt that he did not comply with that order. He absolutely did not fulfill the requirements of that order. But there were extenuating circumstances. Pope did not know the situation on the ground. And there certainly seemed to be enough contrary evidence to not produce a guilty verdict. But that is the only one of these charges that I see having any merit to it whatsoever. The joint order where we're going to advance, retreat, all at the same time. McDowell receives the same order and does the same things. Where is he in being charged? There is virtually no way for any military officer to have complied with this mess that was the joint order. And probably the most serious charge is the 430 order. The 430 order charges Porter for failure to attack the enemy as directed. Where he is ordered to attack Jackson's flank and rear. There is a slight problem with this order. There was someone else besides Jackson with his and his flank and rear that would have made an attack very problematic, even if the order had been delivered in a timely fashion. A gentleman by the name of James Longstreet has taken up position with a lot of hungry, angry men. And an attack especially started that late in the day would not have been promised. Charge number two, behavior in front of the enemy. A lot of the evidence that supported the charge involving the 430 order would have been relevant here. But what makes this particular charge interesting is that it basically is an accusation of cowardice. The prosecution is basically trying to prove that Porter did not attack as directed in the 430 order because he wants Pope to lose. Porter's defense raises several legitimate claims. First of all, in terms of rank and seniority between McDowell and Porter, who's the senior officer? McDowell. And basically, Fitzjohn Porter is saying that McDowell ordered him to stay where he was. Said that, Porter, you are too far out. This is not a fit place for a battle. And to stay where he was. With the charge that he could hear the guns and did not move to Pope's aid, Porter rightfully claimed that he had the enemy on his front and that the terrain between him and Porter and Pope would have been very, very difficult to pass. The evidence on this charge, again, I think it cuts very strongly in Porter's favor, but we will see here in just a second that the question of the validity and volume of the evidence really is not going to come into play. Here's the joint order that I talked about. You see that our, how our friend John Hennessy described it. Uh, this is the, the poetry and magic that is John Pope. And you can see the three things that the commander is being ordered to do. Move forward, fall back, depart from the order. How are we going to comply with the, all the elements of this disparate order?
One problem that the Federal Army had in the late summer of 1862 was they did not have good maps. Maps of the battlefield that they had were out of date, were not accurate, and we also had a commanding general who shared something with me. He was not good at reading maps. He did not know where his troops were, he did not know where the enemy was. On the top, hopefully you can see that, this is the battle, oh sorry, what did I do? There it is. This is the battle in Pope's mind at the top. And it looks easy. Order to be able to make a smashing attack on Jackson's flank there. But you see the actual tactical situation, you see in the, that uh, name there in the, in the middle, completely changes the situation with Longstreet on the field. Pope had been apprised that Longstreet was on the field and moving into position. He didn't believe it. He thought, the enemy was retreating, and he was expecting Porter to move forward with an understanding of the battlefield that was completely wrong. Okay, our friend Reverdy Johnson is a very skilled lawyer. He is cross-examining John Pope. And he asked him this question. The most important question of the day dealing with the 430 order. Because basically, what Johnson is trying to do is he's trying to get Pope to admit that. that Pope was happy with Porter's decision, and that he, was, he had publicly expressed doubt that he was not going to take action against them. Now, under the Articles of War, if you are going to charge someone with an offense, when do you do it? When it happens. You don't wait. You don't wait for charges to build up. You, you arrest him and prepare to file charges. But you can see from the question there that Johnson is asking, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you do anything? Why were you okay with what Porter had done? And, Pope's re and Pope refuses to answer, saying the question's not relevant. Now, I'm not a trial, a trial lawyer, but those trial lawyers that I do know, if a witness ruled on relevancy, they're going to get a very stern lecture from the judge. Relevancy is not an issue for a witness to decide, that's an issue for the court. And in any case, do you think this question is relevant to the matter before us? Just a bit. So what happens with this hand-picked court that may very well be on a preordained mission to convict this John Porter? Do they let Pope hang himself on this question? No. First of all, they go into closed session, and then the court says it's not relevant. And then they adjourn for the next day. On the next day, Pope comes into the courtroom saying, oh, you know that question you asked me yesterday? I remember the answer now, I've got it. <laughs> Hang on, I'm just gonna tell you a couple things about it. And do not try and read this. I, could, I can hardly read it in the original too, but this is part of his response. 
You know, I couldn't think of it yesterday, but it just came to me, and it's that. I think there might be a little witness coaching going on here. Where Pope is basically coached to say, yeah, I, I, I told Porter that I was okay with what he had done because I didn't know what he had done. I didn't know until I heard from the White House and the dispatches the degree and depth of his treachery. In all of that, that's what you would find. So that doesn't sound like standard judicial procedure to, for one thing, for the court to be clearly protecting a crucial witness, the source of the charges. Giving him a day to think of an answer and then basically presenting him with a script to read. Opinions. Everybody's got them. One thing you will find throughout this proceeding is that on, that on every evidentiary, every legal question, the court sides with the prosecution. dies a couple of days later at Chantilly. But the court still allowed Benny Roberts to testify with what a dead man told him. Just think of the violations of evidentiary rules and procedures that that picks up. My particular favorite, my particular favorite though is Lieutenant Colonel Thomas C. H. Smith. Because if he wasn't in the army, he could have made a living in the circus. <laughs> he seemed to be able to read minds. He's a clairvoyant. When he stops by Porter's tent to discuss some ammunition, uh, Porter's requesting 400,000 rounds. First of all, that doesn't sound like a man who doesn't want to fight, does it? He's requesting 400. Around of ammunition. But look at what Smith is allowed to say about it. In the few minutes I talked to him, I was certain that he was a, tra a traitor. So far as any crime before God was concerned, the law would allow him to do it. He said he should be shot. 
based on a 15-minute conversation in his tent. The court allowed him to testify as to Porter's body language, that he was sure that he was a man set to commit a crime. Now, our friend McDowell was on the stand, and again, the court solicits an opinion. McDowell was allowed to give it that if he would have done so, it would have been decisive. Then comes cross-examination by Reverend Johnson, and suddenly McDowell develops a case of amnesia. I don't recall. I can't remember. I don't know. I can't be sure. And look at that bottom paragraph. Again, it's asking for an opinion, but it's a very relevant opinion, isn't it? Would Porter have been engaged in actionable disobedience given the actual conditions of the battlefield? And that question is stricken, not allowed, because it's asking for an opinion. Are you seeing a trend here? Every decision cuts in favor of the prosecution. Sorry, I'm a theater guy. I can feel a little too close out there. A King and I, Rufus King. Lieutenant Colonel Block is Porter's aide. And Fred Block testifies as clearly, as directly, as as straightforward as he could possibly be with no inkling of any misgivings or attempt to evade or be untruthful. Yes, General McDowell gave that order. Yes, General King was there, heard the order to basically stay put, given. Now, if what Lieutenant Colonel Block is saying, what does that do basically to the entire case on the 430 order? It knocks it out. And this is obviously the most dangerous, the riskiest of the charges that he disobeyed orders to attack in front of the enemy. And now just try and imagine any courtroom situation that you could be in. You have the judges sitting around the table. Rufus King, who was at that meeting, is on the bench. And he is called down from the bench to take the witness chair where he testifies that the defense witness is lying. And then goes back to sit with the court. As I said, I'm not a trial lawyer, but that doesn't sound quite right to me. I don't recognize Colonel Locke. I didn't receive any such message. So the trial goes on for a month. A thousand pages of evidence and testimony. How long does it take to reach a verdict? Did they carefully read through the thousand pages of the court record? No, they're barely out long enough for lunch. Three hours. Porter is convicted on all of the most serious charges. There were a couple of the ones in the first charge about being responsible for a couple of his units going astray and getting lost and not making it to the battlefield in time, which Holt didn't even really argue he's acquitted on. But still, on every other charge in the specification, he is convicted. And he faces the death penalty. These are capital charges. 
But you can see the sentence of the court that was sent to President Lincoln. And in one of the things he does that greatly disappoints me in the president is that he affirmed this sentence and you can see the statement that he signed there. Porter is out in town walking about the street when a reporter from the New York paper tells him he's been convicted and asks for his response. The source of the quote is a very influential Republican. Uh, he's from uh, Pennsylvania and is close with the president and you can see the statement that he makes. And he says that Lincoln did not necessarily approve of the judgment against Porter, but that he felt it was necessary given the circumstances. And I tend to agree with, agree with him. It's uh, painful but true. And then in the blue, what Porter writes in the phone, the Howlands have succeeded at last. One thing surprising is that in the midst of civil war is how big this story is. Now, newspapers were different in the mid 19th century. While newspapers today, what's left of them, will have their political biases, the newspapers in the 1860s were effectively the official organs of the political parties. They spoke for the political parties. And each one of them had so much fodder out of this trial and there was so much public interest in it that this was the Tiger King during COVID. It was the story that people talked about. There's pushback from the Porter side. The Swinton book is one of the first to really make a formal evidentiary supported complaint that Porter has been railroaded. And he does it as a historian with maps. Alfred Guernsey from Harper's writes a very fulsome defense saying that the verdict in its entirety was not justified. Porter reaches out to U.S. Grant. Expecting perhaps some sympathy from a fellow soldier, a brother in arms. But I'm showing you this from early on in Grant's presidency because we will see some communication from him later in which he would have completely changed his mind. In this case, he says that he can take no action in the Porter case because he has not received any new evidence that would overturn the findings of the court martial. So keep that in mind when you see later communications from President Gray. Another indication that Grant is none too sympathetic for the cause. We have the society gathering. They vote for a resolution. There was apparently only one dissenting vote. And the resolution is carried to Grant's desk by none other than our old friend, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, someone who should receive a warm reception from the president. But Chamberlain is told to go away and to tell Porter not to press it further. 
Grant will change that view after the Schofield report. Okay, you've been an Army officer all your life. Now you can't be an Army officer anymore. Even if you would enlist in the Army, could he be promoted to corporal? That would be considered an office of trust or profit under the United States. He effectively cannot earn a living with the trade that he was taught. So he has to find a way to support his family. And he engages in a variety of things that I just find kind of amusing. That he goes out to Colorado and in very speculative mine work, staking claims in Colorado gold and silver mines. He's in charge of the construction of the largest mental asylum in the United States today. It's one of the largest public buildings in the country. It's a mile to walk around the new insane asylum. And probably more significantly, he is tasked with trying to clean up the corruption in New York uh, in Tammany Hall. The presidential election, Samuel Tilden, the Democrat, Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, and who wins the election? Well, likely it's Samuel B. Tilden. You all remember President Tilden, right? <laughs> but a rather corrupt bargain was struck where the Republican wins the White House and pulls back on Reconstruction efforts. Hayes is more sympathetic to Porter's claims than his predecessors, probably because he personally knew Pope and did not hold him in high regard. Under the authority of President Hayes, the War Department creates a commission to review the case under command, under the direction of General Schofield, who is serving as the superintendent at West Point. The Schofield Commission is a three-member board, along with a reporter sent by the War Department, who is a bit of an unscrupulous character. He is a Tammany Hall politician uh, with limited service in the war, but somehow secured a Medal of Honor award to him that was later revoked for lack of evidence of doing anything good. <laughs> the first nine days that the Schofield Board met, all they did was read the record. They had never seen the record with the defense side included. Everything else that had been published was simply the prosecution's case. Uh, just some quick notes, I'm not gonna read those to you, uh, about the Schofield Board, about what they can and can't do. They can't overturn the sentence. They cannot compel testimony. Lying to them isn't perjury. But what can they do? Well, they have evidence to a whole, or they have access to a whole bunch of evidence that the original court martial did not. They can get former Confederates to come and testify. They can get accurate maps. And with access to all of this information, the Schofield Board. Now, to my mind, they go a little bit overboard, but they basically repudiate the court martial point by point. Once again, McDowell testifies and doesn't seem to remember where he was on any particular day. In the course of refuting every point of the conviction, I think the Schofield Board goes overboard when they say that he was obedient, subordinate, faithful, and judicious, and that he saved the Union Army from disaster. That's a little rich. Now what's he going to do? He's got 
this nice report, but it doesn't do him any good. He can take it to the president in 1881. Who's president in 1881? James Garfield. Where did they last see each other? In the courtroom. Garfield is sitting on that court. He is one of the judges. Is he going to say, wow, I really screwed that one up? <laughs> but sadly for the country, Garfield is tragically shot and dies a few weeks later. Chester A. Arthur becomes president. Again, more responsive. A bill actually passes Congress to wipe away the remnants of the verdict. Arthur did remit his sentence. He removes the ban from government service, but he still stands convicted. But the bill that went to his desk would overturn the conviction, and Arthur vetoes it. He says, I cannot sign a bill overturning a court martial verdict approved by Abraham Lincoln. That's a little funny given that he just overturned the sentence that was approved by Abraham Lincoln, but he says he cannot touch the verdict. Well, when you look at the record, 
If you just took the paper record of the prosecution's case, not knowing anything else that happened on that first charge, you might be able to come up with a guilty verdict, but on none of the others. And then when you read the defense, there's no way that any legitimately composed court could have reached this verdict. You look at those last few things there, using General King as a witness, the opinions, protecting the witnesses. In the entire course of the trial, the conduct of the court, to my mind, was shameful. So where does this leave us? Sorry, this is a big finish. intersection of justice, politics, and war. At the time of Second Manassas, the war was changing. When Confederate forces rout Pope at Bull Run, the Emancipation Proclamation is less than a month away. The conflict is shifting from a war to restore what was to a conflict <coughs> of what will be. Emancipation via the proclamation happens against the backdrop of Pope's crushing defeat, the blood of Antietam, and Burnside's disaster is just a short stroll from where we're sitting. Now, in what is likely a mistranslated axiom, von Clausewitz told us that war is the continuation of policies by other means. The Civil War was by its definition a political war. From, from the outset, it forced soldiers to do things that they had not often been asked to do, to make political decisions. Fitz John Porter kept his distance from politics in his early days. He misunderstood politics when it counted. He failed to make the connection between criticizing his superiors and the political blowback that it would generate. It did not register to him how others in the arena, policymakers, could view tactical decisions as political ones. Overall impression, Fitz John Porter was not an unappreciated hero. He was not an American Dreyfus. His actions and inactions did not cause the defeat at Second Manassas and did not save the cause of the Union. Both the court martial and the Schofield report, to my mind, got these wrong. The court martial occurs at this time that the war is changing, but it neither determined nor defined that change, but it did define the course of the rest of Fitz John Porter's life. But to my mind, the most important legacy of this sorry episode is that Porter's accusers, including the president and his administration, those shaping the change in the character of the war, acted out of weakness rather than strength. This included that man who throughout the conflict had been resolutely strong, but here he acted weakly. The president, his administration and the military will later find the strength to win that newly envisioned war. But unfortunately, they do so by destroying a 